This is going to be a special night for me. This is a special night because I got five girls and my baby girl tonight is going to be teaching. Annalisa. The greatest thing that we could do is pass on our faith to our children. And, and, and of course, I understand that's war and it's not easy. And it hasn't always been easy. But this is what we do have is a victory. And tonight, for the first time ever here at the Way We're Allowed Reach, my little girl, Annalisa, she's 19 years old. She's our, in her second year at Cal State San Bernardino. She has a word from God that's going to take us to the next level. Understand this. This is not just a little girl. This is a girl with a word from God. I'm telling you, I want you to receive what God is saying here. So let's give my baby, Annalisa, I love her. I'm so proud of her tonight. Let her know she, you're ready to receive from her. Take some notes. Get ready. Annalisa Garcia. Love you, mama. Mine. This is wild. Guys, I grew up in this church. I don't know if you guys heard, but it's the 19-year anniversary. I am 19 years old. So I was literally like a little tiny baby, not even walking when this happened. And so I truly am a product of this church. It's an honor to be just doing this in front of my family. Most of you guys have seen me grow up and pour it into me. And so it's truly an honor that I have this opportunity to pour back into you guys. You guys are amazing. I want to honor my dad, Pastor Marco, and my mom, Lisa. They are amazing. They're amazing parents and they truly love God. I would not be here if he wasn't the real thing. I'm telling you that right now, he lives it in and out of, on, on the stage. And so I'm just excited to be here with you guys. And before we start, let's just go ahead and pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity, God. I thank you, Jesus, that we are here to hear from you, God. That you have a word prepared for your people, Jesus. I thank you, God, that you have plans, God. And we thank you that you, Lord Jesus, allow us to be part of those plans, that you give us insight, you give us direction, God, on what the next season is, Jesus, what the next level is, God. So we pray right now, we prepare our hearts, God, for what you have. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. I'm excited. Are you guys ready to hear a word from God? Well, I'm ready to give one. <laughs> well, just a little intro. The goal of this message is to remind us of the war we are in and our identity as soldiers for Christ. We are in a spiritual battle and God has empowered us to win this battle and help others overcome. I did not come to give no sissy lala word. I am here to declare war on the enemy. And I know you guys are too. Well, there's a scripture in Ephesians 6, as you guys get out your notes and your Bibles, if you could turn there with me or scroll there with me. Ephesians 6, 12, it says, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in heavenly places. And I wanna to go to the definition of fight. To engage in battle, attempt to defend oneself against or to subdue, defeat or destroy an adversary. And in the first part it says, we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. And I wanna stop right there. God mentioned that for a reason. We're not fighting physically. We're not fighting our families. We're not fighting each other. God is not telling us we're throwing hands with each other. But God is saying we are fighting against a spiritual enemy. This is not a physical war, but it is a spiritual war. And I think that a lot of the times we can stop and fight the wrong battle. And the enemy knows that if we're fighting against each other, then we're not focused on him. Then we're not fighting him. And so let's right now look at this scripture. It's showing us what we are fighting. It's showing us who our enemy is. We are in a real battle and we have a real enemy. The enemy is not each other, but the enemy is Satan. Now the word says that Satan's goal is to steal, kill, and destroy. He's against us all. Whether you live for God or you don't live for God, he is against you. 
He desires to steal our peace, to steal our joy. He desires to bring division in our families. He desires to, for us to hate ourselves, to harm ourselves. This is the desire of the enemy and this is his goal. He is the face behind all the darkness that you've experienced and have seen in the world. Now, Satan is the enemy, but the good news is that God is greater than any enemy that we can face. The good news is that Jesus already defeated the enemy on the cross, and he's given us the authority to defeat him as well and help other people overcome. Now, there's a dream that God had given me that kind of embodies this, this fight and this question of what are we fighting for? We know that the enemy is Satan. We know that we're fighting not against each other, but we're fighting a spiritual battle. And so the question is, what are we fighting for? And that's my title today. If you guys are taking notes, what are you fighting for? Now in this dream, there was a room, it was a small room, and it was full of, of soldiers that had just been recruited to the army. And in this room, they were gonna be equipped for battle. And there was a lineup and the first man got up and he shared with them all of the physical warfare that they would go through, that they should expect to encounter. He shared that they should expect to encounter guns, ambushes, bombs, and they should always expect and prepare for a fight. And after this guy got up, another one came up and it was a scientist. And he explained all of the chemical warfare. He explained that they wouldn't just be facing regular bombs, but they would be facing poisonous bombs in conjunction with extreme temperatures. And then there was me. And I don't know much about physical warfare, but I do know about spiritual warfare. <laughs> so I got up there. And when I got up there, I seen just a room full of people that were full of fear. That after hearing all of these threats, they were already worn down. They've already accepted the defeat. And I got up there and I felt the Holy Spirit rise up in me. And as I began to speak, I seen these people lean in and come to life. And I asked them this one question, what are you fighting for? What are you fighting for? Because if you know what you are fighting for, it doesn't matter in the face of danger, in the face of all of these threats, the only thing that matters in the face of that is what you are fighting for. And so today I ask you the very same question, what are you fighting for? Ask your neighbor, what are you fighting for? Well, we're about to find out. Well, in Luke 19.10, it shares what we're fighting for and it shares what Jesus came here for. Now, if Jesus came here to die on the cross, to give up everything, to leave heaven and die as a sinless man for something, I wanna know what that something is and I wanna be able to fight for that thing as well. It says in Luke 19, 10, Jesus said, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So what are we fighting for? We're fighting for souls. We are fighting for those who are lost. We're fighting for those who don't have Christ in their life, who are in deep, dark pits. And I'm sure a lot of us can understand because we've been there. Now today, we know what we're fighting for. We know who we're fighting. Now what does it look like to fight? Well tonight, I'm gonna give you three attributes of a good soldier for Christ three attributes of a good soldier for Christ. Now in 2 Timothy 2, 3 through 4, it talks about this good soldier. Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life, for they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. And so the word is confirming that, first of all, we are soldiers, but there is such a thing as a good soldier and a bad soldier. And so today we're gonna describe what it looks like to be a good soldier. Attribute number one of a good soldier. A good soldier is kingdom-minded. A good soldier is kingdom-minded. And in Hebrews 13, 14, it says, for this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. Now, what does it look like to be a kingdom-minded person? A kingdom-minded person is aware that this earth is only temporary. This is not our home, but this is a temporary home. A kingdom-minded person knows that we have an eternal address in heaven. 
that you guys obviously have an address wherever your home is, but that is temporary. The Bible says that our life is but a vapor, but a vapor. That is nothing in comparison to our eternity. So they know that we are still here on earth to fulfill a specific purpose. If this wasn't the case, if we got saved, we would just go to heaven. But the case is that we have a purpose here on earth, that we are here for a short amount of time. And so let's go into what that purpose is. In Acts 20, 24, it shares, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying the good news of God's grace. That's so powerful. The definition of aim is a purpose or intention. So this man, he's saying his whole purpose in life, his whole aim in life is for this one purpose of sharing the good news. There is more to life than just being happy. There's more to life than, than what we may think, than going through cycles. There's more to life that God has for us. And he's sharing this is the more, this is what I'm living for. Now, this is an amazing, amazing commitment right here. He's saying my life is worth nothing to me. And he's not saying his life isn't worth anything. Well, he's saying in my hands, it's worth nothing. If I'm not giving God the glory, if I'm not sharing good news, if I'm not reaching souls, then what am I here for? And so if we see this man giving up everything for this message, that makes me real interested in the good news. The good news is this. That every one of us has sinned. Every one of us. How many of you guys have sinned? Every one of us has sinned. But Jesus paid the price. The Bible says that the penalty of sin is death. And Jesus, he died on the cross. He came down from heaven. He died as a sinless man so that we can be made free. And that is the good news. That if you're here today and you are dealing with anxiety, if you're here today and you feel overwhelmed, just like that room of soldiers, if you're here today and you need more in your life, the good news is that God is that more, that God can set you free, that God defeated whatever you're dealing with on the cross, and God has given you the victory. I think that us Christians have the most vital mission in the world. Of course, there's soldiers, there's physical soldiers in the fight for our physical freedom, but we have an eternal purpose. I think we have to recognize that souls are on the line, that people are dying. And I wanna give a little statistic on those deaths. 67.1 million deaths happen per year. 106 people die per minute. That's more than one person per second. So within the 35 minutes I have with you guys today, 3,710 deaths will happen around the world. And we have to recognize these people, they don't have a second chance. They're going into eternity, whether it's eternal heaven or eternal hell. And so in this, this should give us an urgency that we have the responsibility, we have the power to reach these people that are dying. We have the power to give them the answer, to give them that eternity and the good news. Everything we do is for the fulfillment of the purpose that God has given us here on earth. Spreading the good news and reaching the lost isn't part of our lives, it is our lives. I'm gonna say that again. <laughs> Spreading the good news and reaching the lost is not part of our lives, it is our lives. That is what we are here for. It is intertwined in everything that we do, in our workplaces, in our relationships, in our careers, in our schooling. It is intertwined in everything. And there's a, uh, an example that I wanna give. Recently, there was an interview on ESPN, 
And there's a champion softball team. They're 51 and 0, so they are undefeated. And in this interview, these um, softball players, they begin to share where their joy comes from. And in their games, they're giving glory to God. And they continue to, to persevere and continue to um, give God the glory through their softball, even when they're giving, um, even when they're getting hatred. And so because they're living for God, they're serving God and they're glorifying God, they've gotten a lot of backlash, a lot of backlash. People are against them and they feel like they shouldn't be spreading their message. But the funny thing is, is that we have a whole month for Pride Month. And people want to celebrate pride. People want to celebrate false identities. People want to celebrate that. But when it comes to God, they're against it. And going back to the scripture, this, we know why this is happening. This is a spiritual battle. The enemy is against us. The enemy is against the good news. And so I'm going to go ahead and if they play this video and share their word. Yeah, um, I think a huge thing that we've really just latched onto is eyes up. And you guys see us doing this and pointing up, but we're really like fixing our eyes on Christ. And that's something where, like they were saying, you can't find a fulfillment in an outcome, whether it's good or bad. And um, I think that's why we're so steady in what we do and, and our love for each other and our love for the game, because we know this game is giving us the opportunity to glorify God. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I just think once we figured that out and that was our purpose and everyone was all in with that, um, it's really changed so much for us. And I mean, I know myself, I, I've seen so much of a growth in myself with um, once I turned to Jesus and I realized how he had changed my outlook on life, not just softball, but understanding how much I have to live for and that's living to exemplify the kingdom. And I think that brings so much freedom. And I'm sure everyone's story is similar, but we all have those great testimonies that have really like shown how awesome it is to play for something bigger. Um, and I think that's just what brings me so much joy. And no matter the outcome, whether we get a trophy in the end or not, we're, this isn't our home. And I think that's what's amazing about it is we have so much more. We have an eternity of joy with our Father, and I'm so excited about that. And yes, I live in the moment, but I know this isn't my home. And um, no matter what, my sisters in Christ will be there with me in the end um, when we're with our, our King. So, Wow. Now that is an example of living for Jesus and living for the good news in everything that we do. Even in playing softball, they were glorifying God. And playing softball, they found purpose. And look at their scores. God is for them. <laughs> it's working. It's working. <laughs> Attribute number two of a good soldier. A good soldier is alert. A good soldier is alert. Now, the Hebrew definition of alert is watchful, vigilant, wakeful, aware, wide awake. So this is the state that we should remain in. In 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. And the definition of prowl is to move around restlessly and stealthily, especially in search of or as if in search of a prey. So the enemy is restlessly, restlessly seeking to who he may devour, seeking to destroy people. He's looking who he can tear down. And the enemy knows that if he can separate us from the good news, if he can separate us from the word of God, if he can separate us from the truth, that we will stay in bondage to the anxiety. We will stay in bondage to the depression. We will stay in bondage to sin. And so in this scripture, there's two parts. One is for us to be alert, to not fall into any traps of the enemy. So a good soldier is alert to not fall into any traps of the enemy. And this is important because the enemy's goal is to blind us. 
The enemy's goal is to, to focus and trip upon all these other little things so we don't focus on our eternal purpose that God has given us. That if we're so focused on all of the division, if we're so focused on just trying to not sin, if we're so focused on, on falling on these things, then people will not get saved. And then there's a second, to also be alert to the unbelievers around us. We know that the enemy is looking to see who he may devour. And it's our responsibility to be alert. And I want to give an, an example of right now what the world is looking like. We know that the enemy's goal is to steal, kill, and destroy, and devour. And we see that happening. Anxiety is on an incline by 63% in young adults. Approximately 280 million people in the world are dealing with depression. Suicide is one of the highest causes of death in the U.S. And more than a third of Gen Z identifies as atheist. More than a third. And that just shows the enemy is doing everything he can to separate us from the word of God to trip us up, to, to devour us and steal our peace and steal the truth, steal our identity, steal our clarity. And just a personal example, um, I think my dad said this, but I'm in my second year of college and woo -woo. <laughs> two more years. But the enemy is not playing around. I'm telling you, in those colleges, we need, I mean, everywhere, but in those colleges, I've experienced some spirit, like serious spiritual warfare. And so um, I believe it was a couple semesters ago, I was in my English class. And the very first class, my English professor set out on a mission to convert and persuade everyone that God was not who they thought he was. She made statements like religion is poison, that God was actually evil, unfair, just, and that the Bible is made up and has no power and should not be taken as truth. And in this class, she had her high school daughter um, attend the class and she asked her daughter, what are the three things that we ban, that are banned in our household? And number one was drugs, another one was bad friends, and the third was religion. So she's actually not only spreading this to the school, but she's spreading this to her children, that religion, God is actually banned in her household. And so I'm not about to sit there and let that happen. I'm telling you right now, I am not going to let this person spread demonic lies to these impressionable college students. So let me tell you what happened. First class, it was, I was already going at it. I was like, actually, that's not what the word says. This is what the word says. And I was giving scripture. I was sharing my personal testimony. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. That girl, she, was, she had enough of me. I'm telling you. I think out of the whole semester, I raised my hand about 10 times each class. Like, I was any tiny thing. I was like, all right. This is my job right here. Like, I am not going to let these students hear these lies without a fight. Like we have to have a fight in us. We cannot allow the enemy to come into our territory and steal people from the kingdom of God. And by the end of it, she thanked me. Thank you, Jesus. She thanked me for fighting for what I believed in and I invited her to church. So... <laughs> But really, when I was in that class, there were so many other Christians that admitted they were Christians, but they were also cussing and they were also doing this and like in sin. And so I had to take the responsibility to be alert. I seen the schemes of the enemy, but to stand up as a Christian, to stand up as someone who follows the gospel. I don't follow the culture of this world. I don't follow the schemes of the enemy and I'm not gonna submit to them either. Woo, I got a lot in me, all right. Man, we got 11 minutes, now I know how my dad feels. I'm like, let me hope I can finish this in time. <laughs> all right, attribute number three of a good soldier. A good soldier perseveres. A good soldier perseveres. Persevere. 
Continue in a course of action, even in the face of difficulty or with little or no prospect of success. Now in 2 Timothy 4, 7, it says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now this is Paul speaking. And in this battle for souls, Paul is explaining how he fought the good fight. To fight the good fight means to hold on to your faith and the mission to the very end. That even in the face of obstacles, even in the face of, of rejection, even the, in the face of betrayal, you hold on to your faith and you hold on to the mission of fighting for souls no matter the cost. Now, he's saying he fought the good fight. And you're about to see how good the fight was. In 2 Corinthians 11, 24, 27, this is all that Paul persevered through for a soul. He persevered through five different times. The Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. That's five different times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, how dare they, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers, uh oh, but are not. I have worked hard and long, and during many sleepless nights, I have been hungry and thirsty, and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. That is some serious stuff. Like, Paul lived nine lives. Like, that is wild. How can someone go through all of that in one life? But what caused Paul to persevere through so much pain? That out of all of that, he still kept fighting, right? He just wanted to reach one more soul. He persevered to reach one more soul. That if one more soul could be saved, that if one more soul could be free, that if one more soul could be delivered, that if one more soul could be freed from the spirit of depression, that if one more soul, just one more soul can come to God, then it's all worth it. Then I will keep fighting for one more soul. How valuable is one more soul to you? How valuable is one more soul to you? In the face of death, torture, famine, betrayal, the only thing that pushed him through was knowing what he was fighting for. The only thing that pushed him through was knowing what he was fighting for. And so in our lives, when we're faced with trials, when we feel like quitting, when we feel like giving up, and when we're in the face of danger, persecution, when our family's telling us, no, I don't want God, or they're making fun of us, when you're in a situation where people are telling you that God isn't real, like I was, when you are going through the toughest times of your life, remember what you are fighting for. You are fighting for souls. You are fighting to reach one more person. Now as I close, if we could all stand up. Thank you, Jesus. You know what, I wanna do this with you guys. Let's all stand up. And I wanna make a declaration because we're not weak. As soldiers for Christ, we have victory. That victory is actually in our identity. And so today, I want you guys to repeat after me and say, I am a soldier for Christ. Let's say it louder. I am a soldier for Christ. Let's say as an army, we are soldiers for Christ. Woo! Do you guys hear yourselves? That was amazing. Now today, 
I want to make two calls. And the first one is, if you're already saved and you've already given your life to God, but you haven't been fighting the fight, you have not been living out your purpose, maybe you've been sitting on the sidelines or maybe you've been ashamed of the word or, or fearful or just comfortable, today is your day to accept the call, to truly join the army, to fight for souls, to live for the one purpose of reaching one more soul. And I think that every single person, we can remember where we came from. We can remember the hell that God set us free from. I know me, I am a personal testimony of that. I am up here because of God's fulfilled promises. I went through my own things. I, I accepted anxiety as my identity. I accepted depression as my, as my identity. But Jesus, he set me free. Jesus, he gave me life. The only reason why I'm up here is because Jesus, because Jesus had the heart, because my family chose to stand in the gap and fight for me. I am a personal testimony of what it looks like to fight for someone. And I know many of you in here are. And so today, if you wanna accept the call of fighting for the one purpose, I want you to go ahead and raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Amen. Now, if you guys can walk up here and accept that call truly, that you are not gonna be shameful of the word, that you are not gonna stay comfortable, that the enemy is not gonna keep you where you're at, but come from those seats and declare war on the enemy. Mm, thank you, Jesus. Oh, we love you. I'm so proud of you guys. Thank you, Jesus. I'm proud of you guys. They're still coming up, they're still coming up. Give them a hand. They're not gonna stay comfortable any longer, but they are committing their lives. They are laying their lives down to fight for one more soul. Wow. Now my second call is this. For those of you that feel like you're losing in this battle, for those of you that haven't accepted Jesus, and maybe you've been just defeated, you've had defeat after defeat after defeat, that you want more in life. Well, today this call is for you, that God has called us to be more than overcomers, that his word says that we are more than overcomers, but that is only through Jesus. And so today, if you wanna receive Jesus, and if you wanna let him in, and let him fight your battles, then today that is for you. On the count of three, if you're telling me I need Jesus in my life, I'm tired of being defeated, I'm tired of losing this battle, I want him to fight the battles for me, I want you to go ahead and raise your hand. One, two, three, raise your hand. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we love you. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. I'm so proud of you guys. That from here on out, you have the victory. That as we say this prayer, you're no longer gonna go through cycles of defeat, no longer gonna go through cycles of sin, but now you are joining the army, that you are soldiers for Christ. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for the good news that you died on the cross so that we can be free. Jesus, that you overcame every obstacle, that you overcame the great enemy, God, so that we can have the victory. 
Lord Jesus, I pray right now, God, for those people who are recommitting their lives to your purpose, Jesus. Those people who are saying, I wanna fight for one more soul. I pray right now, God, that you would empower them, Jesus. That every fear would be broken off in the name of Jesus. That all complacency would be broken off in the name of Jesus. That the enemy would not silence their voice. That the enemy would not keep them where they're at. But I thank you, Jesus, that they are standing up as warriors, as soldiers for Christ. And so we pray, God, that right now you would empower them. Show them their authority in you, Jesus. And Lord Jesus, I pray for those that are saying, I need Jesus in my life. For those of, of those people, God, who are going through cycles, Jesus, who maybe feel tired of being defeated. I thank you, Jesus, that they will no longer live a life of defeat, but from here on out, they would live a life of victory, Jesus. And for those of you that are giving your life to God, if you could repeat after me, say, God, I thank you for dying on the cross and paying the price for my sins, for my iniquities. Lord, I surrender my life to you. I give up my will, my desires, my feelings and my past and I surrender all control to you. I receive the free gift of salvation in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. How many received a word from God tonight? Nick. I am so proud of you, Amarisa. Let's give Amarisa, I mean, Annalisa, Annalisa, Annalisa a hand. It's her first time I've heard her speak today, just like you have today. And she did a really great job. So proud of her. And we're believing that God's going to use her to teach and preach throughout the world. How many believe that? That tonight is a, it's, it's getting ready for her, a platform that's been developed here.